Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Illinois Senate President John Cullerton shocks Springfield with the news that he's retiring as lawmakers come up empty on the revised Chicago casino plan. We did those things and now we must come together and do more. Senator John Cullerton is stepping down in January. Now the jockeying to replace him has begun. Well, it's a great day. The fall veto session delivers a win to Governor J.B. Pritzker. Lawmakers agreed to a major consolidation of public safety pensions. You know this as well as I do. In a veto session, it's a narrow window of time, and realistically, um, we've had a day and a half of, of work this week. Um, it's like going through the eye of a needle. But no deal on reducing casino taxes yet, as Mayor Lori Lightfoot now hopes for action in the spring. And in sports. Swing pass. Catch me. Cohen. Does he have the angle? Yes. Touchdown, Bears. The Bears need a win over the Rams to help turn this season around. Joining us are Mike Flannery of Fox 32 News Chicago, Kate Grossman of WBEZ, A.D. Quigg from Crane's Chicago Business, and Mike Mulligan of WSCR 670 The Score. We got a lot to get to, so let's start right away. Mike Flannery, why did John Cullerton decide to retire in the middle of his term? I'm not sure. Let's take at face value that he wants to spend more time with the family while continuing to practice law. Um, but it's uh, a tough time in Springfield, a tough time to be a leader. Um, there are some difficult decisions coming, uh, coming down the road, and uh, it certainly appears as though uh, your recent guest, John Lausch, uh, and his FBI agents uh, that he's collaborating with are zeroing in on the inner circle of uh, the guy who leads the other chamber, Mike Madigan. Um, key lobbyists uh, have been recorded. Uh, maybe he decided this is a good time at the age of 71 to go spend more time with the grandkids. Not only are they zeroing in on the guy in the other chamber, but there are two senators, at least two senators, in, in, in the Illinois Senate, Tom Cullerton, who's indicted, Martin his Sandoval, who's cousin. his distant cousin, Martin Sandoval, under investigation. Any notion that that pressure could be weighing on Cullerton's decision? Well, I can't imagine it isn't. I mean, the you know his spokesperson made the point of noting that he was not under he John Cullerton was not under investigation when when this news broke. But I mean, you can't imagine that this isn't weighing heavily on him. I mean, although you know, of course, it is fair for a guy who's seventy-one years old to say enough, though the timing is unusual. And it appeared to catch everyone off guard. I mean, he if he stays there, he gets to help redraw the state's maps, which right, is a coveted is like job. The number one thing everyone thought he was going to wait for. And I was like, Carlton loves the remap, and it would be a huge remap. So it was, it kind of swallowed all the news of the veto session that we were all following so closely. It was like, let's all talk about casinos and all the things that Chicago didn't get. Boom, this news lands at 6.30 last night. He told caucus members, and even some of them couldn't believe it. Mike Mulligan, you expect uh, Senate President Cullerton will be spending lots of time with his family, as most people say when they step down? I mean, look, I, it, there's suspicious and then there's this. I mean, the timing of it is a little bit suspicious. Is that fair to say? Because it just seems like you may as well get out before somebody invites you to or invites you some other place. I don't know where he'll be spending his time. So, you know, it's been, uh, this doesn't make it any easier for Mayor Lightfoot, who on, on her big issues that she wanted from the fall He's veto session. He's an ally for Chicago. Absolutely. She was, she ended up O for Springfield uh, here in the fall veto session. And, you know, the, um, the, the absolute pell-mell fight that's going to be taking place, and then even after the next Senate president is decided, there will be jockeying for who, who plays key roles and who really is the power, you know, th there are alternative power centers. Um, Plus who takes a seat in the Senate? So we'll have- Who takes his district his seat. His district seat. So I'm hearing State Representative Sarah Feigenholtz might make the move over to the Senate, which means there will be a vacancy in the House and a lot of shuffling there, as well as in leadership. She's a key leader for Madigan. So who are the she candidates- She was a key leader for Madigan until all this Me Too stuff happened and she stepped down from her leadership. Who's, who, who are the key candidates to take over as Senate president? We've got a few. Um, I'm hearing there's a coalition of women who are all interested. Uh, Kim Lightford, Melinda Bush, um, Don Harmon. It's a big group of folks, and it's neither of those are from Chicago. None of those. Neither of those are from Chicago. Heather Stain's also in the mix. She's, She's from, from Chicago. Chicago. Um, a ton of names flying out there, and a little bit of time. I think the selection process wouldn't happen until after the first of the year, so there's plenty of time to make deals in between now and then. 
our Kate Grossman, amid all this, there was action in Springfield. This pension consolidation bill, is this going to be a big dent in the giant, massive hole in Illinois' pension funds or municipal pension funds? Um, no, it won't be a big dent. It, it's certainly not insignificant. You know, we've talked for years about trying to do something about underfunded pensions outside of Chicago downstate and suburban police and fire. And so it's, it's certainly a, a nice step forward, but it does, does almost nothing to deal with the large $134 billion pension from the five state pension funds and the teacher funds. So um, I don't want to under... I don't want to undercut it. I think it's significant, but it, it's not. It doesn't get at the, the big apple. Mike no. Madigan, uh, Mike, Mike Mulligan, <laughs> I'm sorry. Freudian slip there. You heard Mike Flannery say that uh, Lori Lightfoot was O for Springfield. Does she come back with egg on her face without, you know, getting that casino deal done? Well, I think they're, they're moving that along a little bit, right? I mean, I don't think I expected that to get done immediately. And she claims that they have made good progress, and you kind of have to take her at a word on that. But, uh, you know, if indeed they aren't, haven't made good progress and if it doesn't get done, uh, you know, relatively quickly in the next year or whatever it is, then obviously that's pretty ugly. And there's all these complicated accounting terms in this new casino bill. In layman's terms, what is different about the casino proposal versus the one that the consultant said was not going to fly in Chicago? Well, you know, they, the, well, the key piece, I think, the people ask me, what is this really all about? And how she's going to cut taxes to make more money? Well, here's the deal. If at, at, a, at an effective tax rate of over 70 percent, the doggone thing may never be built. That was what consultants concluded. Now, there are those who dispute it. But um, a tax rate of 45 percent on something is better than 70 percent on nothing. And so that they, they, they wanted to take it down into, into that neck of the woods. And this is not just Chicago, because $100 million a year from the Chicago casino or so was going to go to the capital program. So it's going to be building, you know, highways from one haystack to another downstate. And, and yet downstate lawmakers said that this was an unfair deal for them and it was giving too much to Chicago. Why this do they is, feel that way? It's a constant tension between Chicago and the rest of the state, that Chicago is always getting these breaks. I think Pritzker will make a convincing argument that the whole state needs this money, so the sooner we get this deal done, the better. Plus, uh, Chicago lawmakers threw downstaters a bone when they passed this pension consolidation, and Chicago needs this casino for its pensions. Yeah, but why did it fall apart, the casino bill? I mean... Springfield is Springfield. It was a it short was never, time. It was never destined to get done. I mean, yeah. this was a very short session. Yeah, you know, this done. is the casino bill. This is a total Pandora's box. And they you know, Lori Life really doesn't have a lot of allies in Springfield. It's not like she, I mean, she went down there, but she doesn't have a lot of weight early in her so term. So I wonder if Kate or AD would agree with me. But uh, well, I'm put in mind, I was down there this past week uh, when the mayor went down, and uh, I got the sense from talking to downstate legislators and lobbyists. Um, I, I was put in mind of Mike Royko's old suggestion for the new city motto, Ubi est mea, where's mine? where's mine? All those guys and gals had their hands out. And here's the dirty little secret. All those other new casinos that have been approved from Waukegan to the south suburbs and elsewhere, they will be thrilled if Chicago's casino never gets built. There is some worry about cannibalization. That's yep. right. If it never gets built, they'll just be going home late at night, pouring their annual bourbon, and drinking a, a, a happy toast. Because... Annual bourbon, once a year. <laughs> yeah, but, they're, but they're legislators, as AD said, they need Chicago cas Casino to be built for the capital program. I mean, that's the main thing Lori Lightfoot has her in her pocket. Her. She doesn't have a lot of allies in Springfield, but she does have, you know, J.B. Pritzker wants that money, as do all the other legislators, and that's her main And in she'll just I need a simple roads. majority. I mean, that, that $100 million a year will, will go actually for the vertical capital, the new, uh, buildings. new college buildings, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Kate Grossman, are you confident that some of the action taken on ethics reform, lobbying reforms, will get to the heart of the corruption that we are seeing as the subject of multiple federal investigations now? Uh, it seemed pretty modest <laughs> with sort of dis disclosure about lobbyists and and their you know economic interests but it, it, no I, I don't think this get this is sort of like 
if the heart is over here, kind of like went it's right by the side. Commission. We all know blue ribbon commissions <laughs> mean do action. Mean action. Um, immediate action. Yeah, so there's also a commission that's going to be set up. There were a lot of Republicans who were arguing that will be heavily leaning toward Democratic lawmakers because Democratic lawmakers get to appoint a lot of these members. We should find out what that Blue Ribbon Commission says by the end of, of course, March. Of course, uh, commission is, Blue Ribbon Commission is political speak for let's punt until hopefully the issue goes away. Mike Mulligan, um, what do you make of the fact that a close ally of Mike Madigan, as uh, reported in the Tribune, his phone calls were recorded. This is Mike McLean, a former state lawmaker. Uh, do you think Madigan should be shaking in his boots? Well, I, I mean, look, Let's be honest about it. There, he's being investigated. There's not a shadow of a doubt. He should be shaking in his boots if he's guilty. I, I can't sit here and tell you that he is. I mean, he's been in power forever. He's, he's got information on everybody. I would imagine his phone conversations would be a great book on tape if you were driving around. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> Who would do the narrating? <laughs> yeah, he could do it himself, apparently. <laughs> What do you think, Mike Flannery? Uh, I mean, is Mike McClain going to be a key witness if there is a, an investigation into Mike Madigan? Well, I'll tell you, I'd love to hear those phone conversations. <laughs> um, you know, uh, look, Mike Madigan first went to Springfield. He was first elected in November of 1968 as a delegate to ConCon. This he's, is a constitutional convention. Yeah, and, and he's been down there essentially ever since. Um, here's a guy who... Um, you know, has uh, has has wielded power and has uh, run. He now runs the Illinois House with an iron fist. They call him the Velvet Hammer. And and you know, it, very different from the leadership style in the Senate, where where uh, uh, Cullerton, Senator Cullerton, has a much lighter touch. Um, if, if I were Mike Madigan, I'd be worried because look, stuff like these disgusting, aggravating um, utility. Uh, like sellouts com that we do, mm. ComEd, and, and we, we, we just let these people rip us off the $2 billion uh, ratepayer increase that ComEd got, and now we're getting a glimpse of how they were really getting that money with the millions they were throwing around like confetti. You know, the, the, the new U.S. attorney, he seems determined to maybe change the rules here. That stuff was done at, almost in the open. Um, the stuff that Madigan... Uh, has done perhaps over the years, maybe the rules are changing. I'd be nervous. All right, let's move on to some city news. Votes are still being tallied at this hour as all teachers are voting on whether to ratify the hard-fought CTU contract. An independent monitor report reveals that CPD is lagging way behind on compliance with the federal consent decree. Mayor Lightfoot slams Uber for allegedly trying to buy off black ministers, but walks that back a little bit. An embattled and indicted Alderman Ed Burke faces a challenger to his 50-year committeeman post. Kate Grossman, is there any doubt about this full teacher's vote to ratify the contract? The union leadership ratified it, but now all the teachers have to do it. Um, I mean, the expectation is that it's going to pass, and we'll find out later tonight. But there, there was some concern because a couple things. The main one was when the union delegates voted to approve the tentative deal um, a couple days before the strike ended, only 60 percent voted, and those are meant to represent their schools. So a delegate comes and whatever my school... It was a much closer vote than clo you're used to with that union. quite close. And so there was, so that was reflective of some pretty serious dissatisfaction with the contract. Things like elementary teachers wanted extra prep time that they didn't get. They wanted more money for veteran teacher pay. Um, they wanted more relief for overcrowded classrooms. So, um, so there is a fair amount of lingering dissatisfaction with the contract. Now you balance that against, you know, this 11-day strike that really was emotionally and financially and everything so wrought, and I don't think anybody wants to go back because that's what that's a very that's real possibility. Happen. Obviously, if you reject the contract, so. I think you weigh that, and it, it looks like it's going to pass. All right, A.D. Quigg, uh, Mayor Lightfoot kind of shocked everybody this week by saying that, or alleging that Uber uh, paid black ministers $54 million to oppose her rideshare tax. Uber denies it. Why did she make this claim? This was surprising to anyone who attended that City Hall press conference. Mayor Lightfoot has one after every city council meeting. She brought it up first, and she brought it up three times. She said, oh, the $54 million that Uber is using to pay off black ministers. And she walked it back a little bit the next day by saying, 
Uber was basically saying, this money will go toward investments in your community. But it, it derailed the entire rest of the day. It's all I could report on for the rest of the week. Um, Uber obviously denies it vehemently, um, saying it was a mischaracterization. They asked her to retract her statement. Um, I took an Uber on the way here tonight. We were just talking about how Uber is waging this full-on campaign against this hike in fees. I think that will continue until the budget vote. This has been a really interesting But fight. apparently they have a counter proposal that would tax uh, residents more equitably. There'll be low tax zone, medium tax zone, high tax zone. They say that's a better plan than the mayor's plan. Is this a serious offer? Well, what it also does is protect a lot of the revenues that they get from offering rides downtown. So the money spot is downtown, and that's also the congestion spot that the mayor is trying to get at. They're basically trying to say, we want to push people toward high transit areas, if they live in a high transit area on the north side, they would pay a little bit less. But Lightfoot says, you're not earnestly trying to do anything to cut down on congestion, because if we do, it hurts your profits. Mike Mulligan, are you going to take Uber less if, uh, if these new taxes go into effect? You know, I don't think it would affect my use of Uber either way, honestly. Especially if the score is if uh, I need it, paying I'll, the bill. I'll use it. Oh, no, that never happened. Um, but I do think <laughs> <laughs> and I mean this sincerely. I, you know, I grew up on the south side, and there there were not a lot of transportation hubs. You were left with buses. There's not, there's, you know, you could take two buses to get to the L if you wanted to get downtown. Mm -hmm. I mean, Uber is, there are neighborhoods where this is a really important well, thing. I remember the informal jitneys that, you know, were unlicensed and, and it, just ran up and down streets like a right. cottage or stony. Yes, and, but you could, and there are older down. people that will need that help and, right. it, yeah. and can use this. And listen, she's in a trick box. I mean, she needs to raise money. She came into a bad situation. We all know what's going on. But a $3 in certain, I think that is not a terrible idea that Uber proposed. I, I don't quite understand. I, I think she just wanted the tax, and that was and it. And that's at the heart of it is that is that Uber is saying if you're in a transit desert, you're, you're not going to be penalized. But on the yes. south and west sides, it's not going to be this $3 charge we're talking about. She's talking about $3 if you're taking a single ride downtown. Especially if you're taking a shared ride, the cheapest ride you could take is a shared ride on the south or west sides. And I have the friends that drive on that Uber. is zero. I have I friends who will, so right. will affect their, their livelihood. And right? that's exactly what Mayor Lightfoot is saying. She's saying that she's not increasing the fees in on the south and west side and that that's what Uber is trying to do, drive a wedge, divide the black community and, you know, demonize her and that that's their game. So is this $40 million Uber tax going to fall apart when she needs the uh, budget vote? Uh, you know, it... This is going to be a tough budget. Uh, th this is her first. Um, she's got a lot riding on it. Um, depending on how much property tax uh, th there is here, some of her uh, key allies, I mean, uh, guys like uh, uh, Alderman Wagesback, um, you know, uh, Michelle Smith, Alderman Michelle Smith, the 43rd Ward, if there's a significant property tax increase, they, they may not be able to, to vote for, for those kinds of pieces to it. Um, if you could break this out, I think it, I think the mayor could pass it, um, and maybe in the end there'll be a single vote on that. But I think inevitably this is going to get caught up with the entire budget, and going over Springfield this week didn't help. Doesn't that. bode well. We got six weeks to figure out the budget. All right. In other news, the Chicago City Club board refuses CEO Jay Doherty's resignation amid FBI raid and speaker cancellations around his comment lobbying work. After a four-year battle, Palatine School District allows transgender students unrestricted locker room access and blowback to Northwestern journalism students over an apology they issued. You know what? I want to hit that last topic. Do, do we believe that the, the media, the Twitter sphere was a little hard on these students uh, for writing an editorial in the Daily Northwestern apologizing for doing basic reporting? Yes. Yes. It's too hard. I'm, I, I, I was a high school newspaper editor and then a college newspaper editor. I screwed up. Thank God there wasn't uh, Twitter or other social media there uh, looking over my shoulder and... and uh, whacking me every time I made some mistake. Well, I thought it was harsh, but I mean, honestly, when I read that editorial, I, I was, I couldn't believe what I was reading, and I was, I was honestly confused. I was like, isn't this basic journalism they're talking about? I, I couldn't actually believe that what I was reading was correct. I had to read it like a few times to make we all did. sure. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, of course. Which is not to say you can't criticize it, but, right. but I in, thought. In I, a I, constructive way would yes. be better. And, and just to clarify, they were apologizing because they were getting heat from students for 
you know, going reporting a rally. Uh, Jeff Sessions spoke there, and they had pictures that they took at the rally, and students didn't like that. And they got students' phone numbers from the directory. Students thought that was too invasive. A.D. Quigg, is, is this maybe possibly part of a new generation of journalists, though, that are more into this um, never being offensive safe space culture? Well, it is an interesting... It's an interesting experiment in listening to feedback and listening to marginalized communities who feel like they have not been listened to in the way that journalism is done. Um, I think I agree that a lot of the Twitter criticism was overdone. These are students. It's a learning opportunity. And it was a good opportunity for people to hear what these students who didn't want their photos taken really thought. I don't, I don't think we engage enough with those audiences to begin with. Speaking of marginalized communities uh, out in the suburbs, after years uh, of battle, uh, transgender, the board, the school board, voted to allow transgender uh, people to use the bathroom of their gender identity. Is that the end of this issue, do you believe? Well, probably not, but, but maybe there. And it's been an amazing turnaround. I mean, you got to give the American Civil Liberties Union of Illinois credit. They've been out there for several years, and um, they, they changed public opinion on this. Um, and... You know, I, I think there's a sense now, perhaps uh, uh, more of a sense of compassion for these kids who um, don't feel comfortable in their previous uh, gender assignment. Um, you know, it's it's not something they're doing frivolously. That's that's clear. And All I right. also think this is amazing too. This this fight that went on in Palatine for four years. I mean, in that time span, this has now become the norm to give stu transgender students full access to the locker rooms. And so Palatine is actually sort of late to the game, which I think really is very telling about how things have changed over the last couple of years. All right, let's move on to sports. Can the Bears turn this season around with a game at L.A. on Sunday? Could Colin Kaepernick land here? And after the general manager's meetings, what lies ahead for the Sox and Cubs this offseason? Mike Mulligan, do we know whether the Bears are going to send someone to this NFL-sponsored workout for no, Colin Kaepernick? We, we still don't know. I mean, this this is a crazy thing that they've that the league is doing. It's you know, there is an element of kind of a PR stunt to it. Mm -hmm. Teams bring in players every Tuesday for tryouts. Any team that was interested in Colin Kaepernick right, they had three over years the last two years and eight out. months could easily have brought him in and tried him out and looked at him and talked to him and all the rest of it. So a couple of teams did do that. He did have uh, different conversations. People did look at him. It was rumored to be close at a couple of situations. But the Bears, I you know, if we are at a point where the psyche of the quarterback is so frail that you can't look at another quarterback, oh, my goodness gracious, then this season is don't even <laughs> think they're going to get a chance of getting out of this hole. I, I think it's crazy. I think they owe it to the league to show up. They owe it to due diligence to show up. Um, you know, look, any, anybody, the, the Patriots are going. If I were them, I would follow whatever the Patriots are doing <laughs> and attempt to do same. It just seems like that's, you know, pretty good policy. Well, the McCaskies tend to be a little more conservative. Do you right. think they don't want uh, anything to do with the controversy? I think, I, I think in a lot of ways what's going on now with, with Kaepernick, I, I think it's, it's, it's wretched that it got to this point. But the guy hasn't played in two years and eight months. So if you're going to sign him, you're better off doing it in the offseason, get him into your program, get him into a training camp, get him through a preseason, see if the guy can play. I don't know that bringing him in now, I mean, I, I think Colin Kaepernick is better than either of the backup quarterbacks that they have up at Alice Hall. He might be better than the starter, to be brutally honest about it. So it, it's just, it's just, I can't see anybody who hasn't played for that length of time being able to just walk out onto an, an NFL field and play. Maybe in Baltimore because his old offensive coordinator is there. And they have a great quarterback they have, with they Lamar don't, Jackson. They don't need him. Yeah. Um, speaking of the starter, it, do we have any optimism now after the three touchdown drives against the vaunted Detroit Lions yeah. defense uh, last the Sunday? 27 rated defense in the NFL. Uh, this is a much better opponent. I don't think, I think it's very interesting because there's a certain kind of parallelism between both teams. They've got the, the offensive coordinator genius guys now as head coaches, and, and McVay probably better than Matt Nagy, but both guys really struggling. Jared Goff, the difference between the Bears and, and with Trubisky and Jared Goff with the Rams, they've paid him already. Right. So they're stuck with him. The Bears still have to figure out whether they're going to give Mitch the, the franchise quarterback money. It certainly doesn't seem to Not earn that, that money yet. I think they're a live dog 
to talk sports cliche uh, out <laughs> oh, in L.A. You know, there's a great article in the Tribune, a deep dive into, you know, yeah, the draft and, mm -hmm. and how the Bears chose Trubisky over Deshaun Watson and Patrick Mahomes. Is it clear to you from that that they really didn't do their due diligence? You know, I, I know a lot of people didn't like the idea that they didn't bring Deshaun Watson in and didn't interview him and, and didn't spend the amount of time on him. You know, he had two knee injuries. He was an undersized guy. He was a great player in college. They didn't like him. They, they had made their mind up on Trubisky. The, the, to me, the big mistake there was that Trubisky was 8-5 and five in college. He played one year. The at guy North he Carolina, played in North not, Carolina, he never, he didn't elevate that powers. program. It's easy to look at it now yeah. and say that they made, because guess what? They made a horrible, wretched decision. They, you know, Patrick Mahomes is the MVP, and Deshaun Watson is, is a great player, maybe an MVP in the future. Quickly, what decisions are the Sox and Cubs GMs going to make this offseason? This is going to be fun, because I think the White Sox need to spend some money. The problem is Scott Boris has is is got the top 10 free agents, and the Sox don't like doing business with Scott Boris. Yeah. You better figure a way around that. The Cubs are trying not to spend money. They are trying to get under the luxury tax. We talked to Tom Ricketts about a week ago, and he, he was very frank about the idea that, that just because you pay the money doesn't mean you have the success of certainly the second highest payroll in baseball, and, and look what happened to him. So I think they're, I don't think Castellanos comes back. Mm. They're, they're rumored to be talking to Baez about a contract extension, so that's kind of interesting. You know, they're going to trade Wilson Contreras, it looks like, because they feel like they have catchers in the system and All right. they need help. A lot of action to follow. We're out of time. Mike Flannery, Kate Grossman, A.D. Quigg, Mike Mulgan, my thanks to you. I'm Parashutz. We'll see you on the next edition of The Week in Review. And we didn't get to this issue about the City Club and Jay Doherty, uh, who was lobbying for ComEd, but he's running this nonprofit, the City Club. Is he in trouble, you think? He is. I mean, $3.1 million. Um, it's an outrageous sum. And he's doing any. this work out of the City Club office. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Robert Clifford is the honoree of this year's Illinois Bar Foundation's annual fundraising event that raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.